Again, welcome to Ramsey County Child uh, Foster Care Relative Orientation. We just want to welcome you all for taking the time out to spend the afternoon with us. My name is Karen Franklin. I'm one of the foster care licensors in the unit. Uh, a little bit about myself is that I have over 20 years of experience both in foster care and adoption. This is my lovely co-facilitator, Ms. Relda. Hi, I'm Relda Brown. I have 21 years in child protection and nine years with child foster care. And, and we now really that, want to welcome mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, to our virtual experience. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> that you know about uh, myself and Rhoda, we would like for you all to introduce yourself. So you can, uh, like Tally stated earlier, is just mention your name and say if you're taking care of a relative or what have you. So Miss Denise, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Denise. Um, my partner Marv and I are adopting uh, two grandchildren, uh, a boy and a girl. Okay. Welcome, Welcome. Denise. Uh, Miss Tracy. Hi. I'm sorry, I missed a, a little bit of it. I had someone at the door. My dogs are barking. Okay. We just want to welcome you for attending. Okay. Okay. Miss Shante. I'm Shante, and I'm I'm gonna be interested in caring for my grandson. My name is Shante Thompson. Okay. Welcome. Shawanda. I'm Shawanda Stewart, my nephew. Welcome. Welcome. Nancy. On mute, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, and I'm taking care of my grandson and my granddaughter. I'm grandma. Yeah. Welcome, Nancy. Welcome. Patrice. Hi, I'm Patrice Stanberry, and I'm um, caring for my twin three year old nephews. Welcome. Is there anyone else that I happen to miss? So how many do we have, six? Seemed like we had more than that, but I can't tell. But okay, we will go there. ahead and um, get started. So our agenda today, we will talk about the child protection system, which uh, Relda will uh, uh, do. And then I will cover the child foster care licensing piece of it. And then any questions that you all may have, please feel free to um, ask questions throughout the presentation. So Relda, oh, okay. go ahead and get us started. Okay, I'm going to start with what all of you probably mm -hmm. know by now is the child protection system where your relatives came from. Um, they come in because of a report of abuse or neglect from either a mandated reporter or a community member. Um, in Ramsey County, we have screeners that are on there 24-7. The report is given to the screeners. They're either going to screen it in and or they're going to screen it out based on the criteria of what the allegation is and whether they think there's an immediate concern or danger for the child. Now, if they feel that there is imminent danger to that child or children, what they will do is screen the case in and set it up for investigation. If it does not reach the criteria to say the child is in imminent danger, they will rule it out and there will be no county involvement. Or if it is something they think that might be a danger, but not reach the level of imminent danger, they will ask the participating family if they would voluntarily do family assessment. 
Family assessment is a part of child protection, which allows the family to work with child protection on a voluntary basis and not go through the court system. If the child or children are perceived by the screeners to be in imminent danger, and that's the words I want you to remember, imminent danger, they will open an investigation. Um, the investigation team has 72 hours to determine whether it meets the criteria for child protection. Uh, within the 72 hours, they have to file with juvenile court and let the court make the final decision on whether these, this family should be in child protection and whether the children should be removed from the biological family. Um, it is not the only thing that comes through. Um, there are other county involvements. We might get involvement from children's mental health or children's DD. But if there's one thing you take away from all of this information is that safety is the number one priority. You gonna change it, Karen? Okay. Can't you see it? <laughs> all right, so, yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah, now I see it, okay. So we're just going to do a little bit about the child protection system. After they have taken it through court, and they have to do it with 72 hours of getting a notification. They have to make that decision. Um, and the final decision on whether Ramsey County should take temporary legal custody of the child is decided mm -hmm. by the court. The parents, bio parents, have a chance to present their case. The county has a chance to present their case. <laughs> but it is the court that makes the final decision. So after you have the initial investigation and the court has deemed that Ramsey County should take temporary legal custody of the child or the children, it is passed on to child protection case management, which will be with the child throughout the child or children's time in child protection. How many of you have gone to a court hearing? I haven't. Gone to, gone to who? Raise your hand. You say what? A court hearing. Oh, I have. But that, not you now, have. that was oh, years ago. Okay. All right. Okay, have you gone to one for the children? No. The one I have now? Okay. Right. Yes. No. She's can everyone make now. sure that they're on mute? We can hear outside noise. Oh, okay. Mute. Yeah, okay. So once it goes through the juvenile court system and a child is deemed to be in need of protective services, it's called a CHIPS petition, um, an ongoing child protection worker will take over the case and stick with the case until the end of the time the child is in child protection. First thing that child protection worker is going to do is get a chance to meet the biological family. Um, and then complete a case plan with the biological parents. And the case plan has always going to be reflective of the goal of reunification. How many of you have seen a case plan? If you just raise your hand. Jawanda? Okay. All right. Um, it is important that if you didn't see a case plan that you actually 
ask the placing worker about a case plan. Why you want to do that, it's because you need to know what the relative has to do in order to get the children back. You also need to look at that case plan because if it includes visitation, you want to know who's going to transport to the visitation, who's going to supervise the visitation, how often is it going to happen. You're also going to want to know some of the logistical issues such as who is going to make medical appointments, who's going to take the child to the medical appointment, is the bio family supposed to be there for the medical appointment? These decisions are laid out in the case plan. So please, if you haven't seen one, please ask to see one so you can keep abreast of what's going on with the case. Okay. So. You want to, go ahead. What? You want me to skip this one since you basically reviewed it already? Well, let's just quickly go through it because we're going to talk about the specific goals for parents. Mm -hmm. It's going to out, outline the plan for children. And like I said, it says who's going to do what, when, and where. And remember, there is always input from the biological parents because the biological parents must sign off on this case plan. And once they sign off on the case plan, um, they have 30 days, the placing worker does, to get it into juvenile court. The judge will look it over, sign off, and then the case plan becomes a court order. Um, and there is a timeline. We're going to get into that later. But again, I cannot emphasize enough foster parents, you need to ask for a copy of the case plan. Any questions? There was one question. Did you see the chat? Um, that's from Nancy. Hold on. Okay, Nancy. Oh. Unmute. Okay, something yeah. just flashed on my screen about the both the parents lost their uh, parental rights or something. Was that from you guys? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. It wasn't from us. That was weird because something just came yeah, there is. It was from me. I am sending a note to the to the three women, I, I forgot to exclude everybody. And okay, uh, okay, but that kind of freaked me out because I'm like, what? Because <laughs> no, my okay. son and his wife, his girl are trying to get together. I'm like, wait a minute, that, that blew me away. Okay, sounds good. All right, no. let's go on. Okay, so Denise, you're saying that in your case, the relatives have lost their parental rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, all the right. Parents, yeah. The parents. the parents, okay. So. so they've lost their parental rights and they went through the court system. They had a certain amount of time to do what they were supposed to do. Evidently, they did not do it. Mm -hmm. And once they lose their parental rights, then the state of Minnesota takes over as their guardian. Right. Okay. Um, and Karen and I are going to talk about the time limit that Minnesota has placed on the children by the age of the children. We talked about the child protection system. We talked about the CHIPS petition. Um, and just as Denise brought up, it's the termination of parental rights, which means that the biological parents, both of them, have lost their parental rights to the children, and the children are made <clears throat> state wards, or the state of Minnesota is their guardian. Let's go on, Karen. Oh, why won't it move? I'm freezing. Uh oh. Oh, there we go. There we go. This is freezing on the screen too when you bring it up. So yeah. So 
let's talk about the permanency timelines that I talked to you before about. Um, five, six years, no, longer than that, 10 years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. um, the Minnesota State Legislature said, hey, we don't want children languishing in foster care. We need to put some timelines on this to make sure we monitor the cases and the children achieve permanency on a timely basis. And what they put the timelines on was the age of the child. So you can see that an infant to eight years old, they wanted permanency to be achieved in six months. How many of you think that is a realistic goal? You don't? Mm -hmm. No, and I'll say that because um, in our case, we had, uh, they were with a different set of grandparents and it, it just was not working out. And mm -hmm. um, there was just a lot of stuff going on. And, uh, you know, we're into, mm -hmm. We're into two years mm -hmm. right now. I mean, with with these kids. Now we've been connected to them through the whole time, and we've been taking care of them. But somebody else had them as foster care sure. prior, and these actions just didn't go through because the attorney for the child, um, there was a lot of complaints. So. Okay, okay, and that is one of the good examples we come up with as to why you see these permanency timelines are not written in stone. Because every family is different and every situation is different. Um, but what they put on there is that they really needed to make sure that someone was monitoring the children and how soon they have permanency. Now, okay, when we talk, a, go ahead. I have a question. Um, okay, example, my grandson, mm -hmm. we've been through this with mom at least four times. He's only seven years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, um, and then now dad's involved. So he's now it's been two two times. We have meaning that they're going into treatment. They come out. They go back to treatment. <laughs> they come out. And during this time, myself, I don't think they're sober, but um. I don't know what my question is. Um, how long? I, I, like I, I don't know. I forgot. I, I lost track what I was saying. Um, you were talking about the timelines and how the, long the kids are in place, pl being placed, right? Uh huh. Okay. Um, I've had them for since November, end of November, and prior to this, their aunt and uncle had them. Okay. okay. So I just, it's been a long period of time since they've been out of home, mm -hmm. out of their home. And then my, I guess my question is, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they want to go home, but yet I can't. mom and dad, they just can't because mom and dad continue to do what they do over and over and over and over again. And um, so okay. how many, I, I heard like, like she had what a year to get her stuff right stuff right well it's been over a year and it's still not right so i don't know what I'm and i to. like i like i said this was not written in stone and every case is an individual case okay. all right what i can tell you is that they really focus on trying to reunite the child or the children with the biological parents absolutely right the thing with that is sometimes that is not a possibility as much as we would like it right and a lot of times especially in a child protection case Child protection workers will see that maybe mom and dad had themselves together, presented like they did, and they sent the children home with them on a trial home visit. That's what they call it from court, a trial home visit, which means the county retains custody, 
but they're allowing the bio parent or parents at least six months to see if they can keep themselves stable and be able to keep the child or children at home. A lot of times that doesn't work out. I was gonna say, cause do they monitor? I mean, yes. with, yes. with, the, with the parents, what they're doing, you know, I'm saying like yes. ways and you know, the child is, um, his, his out, you know, his, his demeanor, you know, all that. Yes, you know? yes. Okay, and that's I, the I, reason I, when they say a trial home visit, we don't give up custody. And the reason we don't give up custody is that we don't want to drag them through the system again. Right. If they find out the parents are not doing what they're supposed to do, child protection can go in and remove the children without okay. asking court or anything else. Okay? okay. Yep. So what I just want you to remember is none of this is written in stone. And the yeah. clock on out of home placement okay. starts ticking the minute they remove those children from the biological parents. So once the children is removed, are removed, there is three different options that come up. One is reunification. We always hope that the child can be reunified with the parent. The other is transfer of legal custody. Now it's called transfer of permanent legal and physical custody. And the last is adoption. And for the adoption, just like you talked about, there has to be a termination of parental rights on the child. Um, the transfer of legal custody, how many of you have heard of that? Okay. I Raise your hands. Do you think that's a, a good permanency option? Yes, no. I didn't see any. Okay, Denise hands. says. Uh, it, it just, I think it depends on the child and the situation. I don't, I mean, I don't think it's at all. You know, the best thing is for a child to be reunited with their parents. Um, when that's not possible, the next best thing is to have family members that can be there for them. Um, Correct. And when we talk about the transfer of physical and legal custody, either to a relative you know, or sometimes foster parent or sometimes kin, that means that that person takes over legal and physical custody of that child until the child reaches the age of 18. One of the caveats about a transfer of custody is that after two years, and the parents have transferred custody to kin, foster parent, relative, that parent can come back through family court and say, I've gotten myself together. I want the children returned to me. At that point, family court is obligated to assign a guardian, just like it did before, and to send the case back through child protection to investigate whether the parents actually have themselves together. So it's only with the transfer of legal custody does this happen. I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. When we talk about adoption, there is the termination of parental rights, which means the parents are not coming back and requesting that the courts take a look at them as a possible placement. Now, that is six months timeline for a child who is an infant to eight years old. 
when we get children eight to 18 years old, they get 12 months. Why do you think it's longer? Would anybody want to venture a guess? Probably because there's more attachment. Go ahead, Tracy. There's more attachment, I feel, uh, as an older child than an infant. That is so true. If you have a nine-year-old or 12, they know who their parents are. Yeah. You know, if they're with a relative or even if they're in foster care in the community, they've seen you know, biological parents, or mm -hmm. they've seen relatives. And a lot of times they feel loyalty to their family. Um, and that way they would rather have a transfer of legal custody till they're 18, rather than just abruptly terminating parental rights. Um, Ruth, did you have a question or comment? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. No, no, I didn't. Uh, I okay. was having trouble with my Zoom, so I was late. So I was just trying to get everything going. Okay. 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 Well done. Right. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention um, in regards to the adoption piece of it, too, is that once a child turns 14, they have the right to consent to uh, remaining in foster care or to a adoption. So that 14 year old would sign a legal document consenting to adoption. And they do have the opportunity to remain in foster care, just so you know that. The other piece to that is if you have a five year old and a 14 year old that are siblings. What happens then, Karen? Well, definitely we want everyone to be adopted and to remain in that familiar group. However, if that older sibling still says, I do not want to be adopted, we have to honor their request. We also can move forward with the adoption of those younger siblings. That's totally fine because we know that those siblings will remain together in one home. So that um, is possible. That is an option for that sibling group. So like I was emphasizing before, there is a lot of individual ways to go with all of these permanency timelines. Um, over here where we see the eight to 18 year old, we also have to figure long-term foster care. Mm -hmm. For a child who might be eight to, main, to be maintained in long-term foster care, mm -hmm. it might be the reason the child is medically fragile. And not so much that the parents abused or neglected the child, but for example, it might be a child who has some very severe medical needs, like you know, kidney problems or kidney transplants. Mm -hmm. And the biological parent or parents may have three or four other kids and they cannot handle the child's needs. It's then that the worker would go before the court and say, Your Honor, I think this child should remain in foster care for compelling reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is that option. Any questions? Okay. And please, if you have questions, if you go to the, your screen on the bottom, you should uh, go into that chat section and you can type your questions as well, especially if we can't see you. That's another way we could answer your questions if you want to type uh, in the chat box. I'm checking the chat box. So, you know, I am checking, those, checking that, just okay. so you know. Okay. All right. 
Okay. Karen, you want to take this? Okay. So there or you are. Want me to do it? No, I'll go ahead. Okay. I'll go ahead. Um, there are different types of okay. child foster care homes. Uh, the first one is emergency shelter. So many of you may have experienced this with your relatives. Uh, prior to them being placed with you, they may have been placed in an emergency shelter. Um, an emergency shelter, do any of you all know what that is? Denise, go ahead and uh, I'm trying to, un okay, go ahead and answer. Uh, well, it can be either somebody who's been through the licensing process and is in a place to be able to take children within mm -hmm. a certain age range, or it can be a facility such as Catholic Charities, St. Joseph's Home for Children or something like that. The only reason why I know more about that is because I used to, to work not in child protection, but with uh, kids with medical needs who were also uh, developmentally disabled. So. Okay. okay, good, good. Yes, like Denise said, basically it is a licensed home and uh, that emergency shelter could be your next door neighbor. So it could be a home right across the street from you. That emergency shelter uh, operates 24 seven, which means that um, the police can drop off a child at 10 o'clock at night or two o'clock in the morning. Um, a child is only allowed to remain in emergency shelter for 30 days. After that 30 days comes up, we would expect the placing worker to already have a relative in mind that they would want to place that child into or another foster care home. Okay. We also have traditional foster care. These type of uh, families are members of the community who basically want to give back. Uh, these could be um, coaches or anyone in the neighborhood that would like to give back. We also have relative kin. That's what you would be considered because you have a relationship to that child. Uh, respite. These are homes that are uh, licensed homes that basically give other foster care families a break. And so respite can happen twice a month and it's usually uh, Friday through Sunday. Um, and so we would ask that if you would like to have respite that you let your licensor know as well as your placing worker know. Everyone is allowed to have respite. Uh, just keep in mind that if you choose to uh, utilize respite, you will not get paid for the time that the child is out of your home, okay? So those are the different types of uh, foster care homes that we have. Let's talk about the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth data. We found out that um, 65% of 400 homeless LGBTQ youth reported having been in a child welfare placement. And because of that, we've seen an increase in homelessness, which, you know, you see a risk of substance abuse, risky sexual behavior, victimization, and contact with the criminal justice system. We also found out that 63.5% of LGBTQ students reported feeling unsafe at school because of their sexual orientation, while 43.9% felt unsafe because of their gender expression. And you can only imagine that a youth, you know, was basically kicked out of their home and ended up being on the streets. And because of that, they've experienced an array of um, risky behaviors, an array of abandonment, and possibly mental health concerns. Um, and also, you know, dr drug and alcohol use. And so we just want to make sure that we're supporting these youth. Um, exactly if you would have a youth placed in your home, you want to make sure that you have a safe, welcoming environment, that you're allowing the youth to be able to listen and talk about anything, that you're also able to um, support their self-expression through choices of clothing, hairstyle, friends, and room decoration, just allowing them to be themselves. 
also uh, keep in mind that, you know, it's the summer months and, you know, if we weren't in the midst of a pandemic, you would be having members of your family come over. You would be having neighbors and friends come over to your home. How would you um, handle a situation if you had anyone that had issues with a child of a different persuasion in your home? Um, they did not like the way that um, this child was acting or behaving. How would you respond in those type of situations? If you had friends or family members who did not support LGBTQ youth. It would be um, my for me, I'd honestly ask them, I would definitely kindly ask them to leave because it's not about them, it's about the child. Yes. Yes, correct. So that's, I would just get right to the point, kindly ask them to leave and they don't need to come back. Exactly. And Tracy, that's exactly what we would want you to say. Um, yeah. Because like I stated before, we want the youth to feel safe. Um, if they can't feel safe in their own home, where else yeah. could they feel safe? So yeah. exactly, we want you to advocate for children. Um, again, let's move forward. Um, allow youth to participate in activities that interest them, regardless of whether these activities are stereotypically male or female, and to educate yourself um, regarding the LGBTQ history issues and resources. Please do not hesitate to um, reach out to your licensor, reach out to your placing worker for additional um, resources. We are here to support you through this um, adventure. I want to say adventure because it is, um, but definitely don't hesitate to contact us, okay? All righty. Let's talk about emergency relative placement. You know, most of us, we had um, nine months to prepare for a child. And you all basically could have had 30 minutes, 15 minutes, or even a day to prepare. And your whole life has been uh, shifted. And so we know that is um, that could be um, a little tricky. And so that's why I stated before that we're here for you all. Um, our goal to get you through this process quickly is to basically have you licensed within 120 days. And now that's going to be precipitated by you and how quickly you can move through the process. Um, you should have already received um, all the initial paperwork um, during this phase. Um, and if you can remember, even with the placing worker, as well as your licensing worker, you should have completed a big packet of information. Do you all remember all that paperwork? <laughs> yes. Okay, good, good. So after, um, you know, you all complete the paperwork, one of the requirements is that you can, that you complete pre-service training. And so if you're providing care for a youth zero to five, everyone needs to complete car seat training. Um, also, if you're providing care for a youth zero to five, everyone needs to complete abuse of head trauma and sudden infant death trauma. Please keep in mind that these two trainings are good for five years. So even if you close out your license and come back in, say, two or three years, those two uh, trainings will still be good. Just keep in mind, we need a copy of your certificate of attendance. Um, everyone needs to uh, take mental health training, relative kin orientation, nuts and bolts, and prudent parenting. Your licensor will provide you with uh, the online link for prudent parenting as well as mental health training, okay? So those are the pre-service trainings that are a requirement prior to you obtaining your foster care license. Um, let's talk about also the licensing process. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we're unable at this point to um, come into your home and meet with you face to face. However, we are doing um, visits uh, via uh, technology, uh, whether it's Zoom or FaceTime or what have you. Um, we do have the opportunity uh, for you to give us basically a tour of your home. 
um, and that's what we will do uh, after COVID is over. Definitely, we will start um, having face-to-face -face visits with you again to definitely go through the home safety checklist with you. Um, you all should have completed the application for child foster care and adoption. The individual fact sheets, I cannot stress enough that please, please, please be open and honest on any documents you complete for us. Uh, if we know that you uh, willingly withheld inf any information, that could be a cause of concern. There is something on the individual fact sheet that asks questions in regards to if you've been involved in any county or state or federal uh, institution, please let us know. If you have um, any health concerns, please let us know, as well as you have to be um, chemically free for the past two years, okay? Uh, for background consents, Everyone that's in your home that is 13 and older will need to complete a background consent form. And I'll go deeper into um, the fingerprinting process. We'll also talk about the payment information and Rhoda will review that with us. Um, background study. So all of you should have completed a background consent form. Uh, those are definitely needed for applicants. And please keep in mind too that um, if you are, um, you know, a two-parent household and um, your significant other is going to be providing parenting to that child, both of you need to be on the application. Um, definitely if you're a husband and wife, boyfriend or girlfriend, live-in partner, what have you, everyone needs to be on uh, that applicant on that um, application as applicant. We do background studies for uh, long-term substitute caregivers, and I'll go into that later. We also do um, background checks for frequent visitors, anyone that's going to have direct access to the children. Now keep in mind, we do not wanna do background checks on 15 different people that's coming through your home, but we definitely wanna do background checks on two or three that's definitely going to have access with the children. Uh, we'll talk about convictions and all of that um, later as well. Okay, so the placement process, usually what happens is that your licensor would come out to your home and uh, basically take a tour of your home to make sure that your home is childproof, making sure that you have all the necessary items. We would also review the additional paperwork, um, make sure that you understand basically the agreement that you're entering into with uh, Ramsey County Human Services and the Department of Human Services. Um, usually we try to do two to three uh, visits based on your family size. And so um, we definitely ask at this time, you know, that you're cooperative, um, that, you know, if you're basically hesitant or what have you, that means that your licensor is gonna be coming out to your home more than once basically to get this, um, piece uh, completed. And so like I stated before, please be open and honest because during this process as well as that we're going to start the interviews uh, for the home study document. We will interview you as a couple. Uh, we, were, we will interview you single um, as well as if you have children five uh, and above who can talk and articulate. And I can tell you right now that we get really, really, really in your business. We're being nosy. So we just ask that you be open and honest. And the reason why we're doing that is because we wanna get a feel for who you are as a person. We wanna know what um, are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Also, what makes you mad? What makes you sad? What do you like to do in your leisure time? Uh, we want to get to know who you are and um, why you're doing foster care. We know that you have relatives in placement, but basically what is your motivation uh, for doing foster care? So that will be uh, part of the licensing process when your licensor meets with you. Okay, let's talk about our responsibility as your licensor is to definitely provide you with support and guidance. 
we are your worker. We are your advocate. No, we're not your friends, but we are your resource and we're here to help you navigate, navigate through this huge system, okay? We're here for you. Um, our job as well is to make sure that we conduct uh, periodic home visits. So the first six months of your placement, your licensor is going to be out to your home once a month. Um, and then after those six months of, of placement, we'll be out every other month. We conduct yearly relicense and review visits. And so every year that you maintain your foster care license, there would be additional paperwork as well as additional training that you all would need to complete. We connect you to community resources. You know, during the summertime, uh, the kids are out of school. So they need camps, they need, um, what else, they, they need something to do. So we provide you with resources, as well as during the winter time and the holiday season, uh, we connect you with resources. If you're needing help with um, mental health services as well, we also help with that. Uh, the number one thing also that we help with is to make sure that you're compliant with licensing rules and laws. And I know many of you may be thinking, you know, I provided care for my relatives before I'm providing care for my own children. Why do I, I have to do this? Unfortunately, it's because the children came into the child welfare system and the Department of Human Services sets the rules and regulations as well as Ramsey County Human Services has our own policies. And so we have to abide by all of those rules and regulations. And your licensor is going to help you uh, with those as well as we make um, monthly visits with you. Your responsibility is to make sure, number one, that the children in your care are safe, that you're providing for them a, a nurturing environment, a place where they can grow and mature and just have fun. And also um, that they be a child. You know, they've gone through a lot. They've been through a lot of trauma. So we wanna provide or ask you to provide some type of normal, normalcy for that child. Uh, to provide us with up-to-date information, uh, for example, incident reports. So if a child should have an accident in your home, we definitely need to be aware of that. Um, if a child should uh, get ill or if you should get ill, we need to be aware of that. Um, and we'll go into um, incident reports um, basically once you take nuts and bolts uh, training as well. I previously stated that we would request that you be open, honest, and accessible. Um, accessible is that uh, we're able to get in touch with you. We're able to make home visits with you. Um, we're here to help you, guide you through this process. And so again, being open and honest. Um, the other would be to complete 12 hours of annual training. Ramsey, Ramsey County has an abundance of training opportunities. Um, right now, of course, we're offering them virtually. So basically make yourself available to attend those trainings. Uh, cooperate with ongoing visits and paperwork and your licensor will be in complete dialogue with you regarding your responsibilities. Any questions? No. Okay, wonderful. All right, how many of you all, this is the big question of the day. How many of you all smoke? Raise your hands. Mm -mm. <laughs> Denise, was there anyone else I can't see? Yeah. I do. Okay, okay, okay. Listen, stop it. Cut it out. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But listen, listen, listen. So back in about... Never, never in the car with kids, Karen, and only out in the garage where the kids do not go. Not in the house. Never. What? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Me, me so, too. I do mine on the patio. Okay, okay, well, listen. I go outside too. I have a cast for all. So I go outside. Listen, we don't want you going outside. No, but listen, back in 2015, Ramsey County Human Services 
um, and the Board of Commissioners came up with a smoking policy that basically states that um, you cannot smoke in your home. Okay, and that also means your garage. Now, if you want to smoke outside across the street, that's totally fine. But please just keep in mind, the reason why we came up with this policy is because we've had a, a huge amount of children coming into child welfare with upper respiratory concerns. And so we definitely do not want to add to those um, issues that uh, children may have. So you definitely want to have a smoke-free environment that also includes smoking in your car. So that means no smoking in your car. Um, if your licensor should happen to come out to your home and we smell smoking or we see uh, cigarette butts, that's the means for a negative action. So keep in mind, we're not saying, no, you can't smoke, but you should definitely not be smoking uh, around the children. Okay. Um, Brother, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you covered it all. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about your physical environment. Uh, Pre-COVID, um, if we were to come out to your home, these are the things that we would expect um, when we're uh, touring your home. Just keep in mind that your homes must comply with fire building and zoning codes. And you all have, should have already received either um, a yellow or pink letter stating that we have notified the city in which you live in that your home is going to be considered a foster care home. Do you all recall receiving a notification of that? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have not, please uh, let your licensor know, okay, because we do notify the city in which you live in. And basically the city will contact you if they have any special ordinances that they would like for you to follow, okay? Um, children need to have a bedroom. We want all kids to have a bedroom. We also want, Oh, go ahead, go ahead Denise. Um, so my question is, and I live in Shoreview, and here, I mean, we are inspected every other year by the city. That's just what happens. So mm -hmm. um, does that, do, do you know about then? I mean, does they, we have to comply to the ordinances of the city. Right. Mm -hmm. And what right. we do is send it out once we get your application in and all your forms we will send out a letter, the clerk does, to the municipality of Shoreview and mm -hmm. say, this woman or this family is applying at, to provide foster care, okay? So it's not on you to do, it's something we do once we receive your application. Mm -hmm. So it's good that the municipality is following up with you and letting you know. And so, like you said, Denise, it's on a yearly basis. So you don't see it happening, you know, every month or so. That's good. Um, children need to have a separate bed suitably sized for them. Um, we are allowing that children of the same sex may share a double bed. But you also want to be cautious because you don't want to um, have siblings sharing the same bed if there's been any sexual abuse, okay? So you definitely want to, to monitor that. Um, your windows, we're definitely not going to come out with a measuring tool, but we definitely may want to make sure that all your windows are working properly. So if your licensor comes out, we want to make sure that we can lift up your uh, windows or slide your windows without any obstruction. And we state that because if there should be a fire or what have you, we want to make sure that everyone can um, get out of that window without any issues. Um, keep in mind that we also need to make sure that the windows are not broken, as well as that you have screens on all of your uh, windows. Your licensor should have provided you with an emergency play card with basically list um, important phone numbers and so forth. Um, did everyone receive that from their licensor? 
Okay, yeah. good, good. Um, a fire inspection may be required of your home, and that's a basically if a trigger uh, occurs. So if you're providing care for four, four or more children, that is definitely a trigger for an automatic fire inspection. Uh, if you live in a manufactured home that was built uh, after 1976, that's definitely a trigger for a fire inspection. Also, if I was uh, your licensor and happened to come out and visit your home and we're taking a tour of your home and I happen to slip and fall, you know, uh, in your home and I look up and there's wiring, there's holes, there's water coming out your ceiling, that definitely would be a trigger for a fire inspection. Now, fire inspections are free to relatives. Uh, before you can um, receive your license, the fire inspector would have to approve that inspection. Uh, some uh, fire inspections may require for um, some additional work to be done on your home. So just keep in mind that um, it is your licensor that would definitely request a fire inspection if there is um, a trigger. How many of you all have pets? Raise your hands. Really, really, really. Wow. <laughs> well, I just want to let you know, I love pets. <laughs> no, she um, doesn't. <laughs> uh, we require that each pet has up-to-date vaccination records. And we ask that because we've had instances where um, youth have been, um, you know, either scratched or bitten by a, a dog or a cat. So we need to make sure that pets, pets are up to date. Um, unfortunately, we've had to remove some children uh, from foster providers' home because of instances like this. So just keep in mind also before you can get your license, we need those up-to-date shots. Uh, Rhoda, what's up with these reptiles? <laughs> Do you guys remember when you had small turtles that they would keep in the home? Well, there's no reptiles, no snakes, no small painted turtles. Anybody know why that is an issue with children under six years of age? Mm. Well, I think most definitely they're going to want to get into them, play with them, and they'll get lost, perhaps? Uh, salmonella. Oh, okay. Yeah, salmonella is an issue with children under the age of six. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and also, and I know you may chuckle about this, but you cannot keep chickens and ducks in your basement, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. You can't keep them in your house. Mm -hmm. You can keep them outside. Stop laughing. You can keep them outside you know, in your yard, in compliance with whatever municipality zoning laws there are, mm -hmm. but you cannot keep them in the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's there because at one point that was a real issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to give you a heads up, when we do start, uh, start back uh, doing face-to-face -face visits and we come out to your home. Some of the things that we, we look at is to make sure that your fire alarms are working so that, um, you know, there's no chirp, chirp, chirp or what have you. We want to make sure that they're working. We also want to make sure that you have uh, the right size fire extinguisher because, you know, if a fire should start in your home, you definitely need to have a fire extinguisher on hand. Okay. All righty, let's talk about supervision and what that looks like. So supervision is outlined in the case plan. Um, each foster parent must be in the home during normal sleeping hours. And so if you're working the second and third shift, who's watching that child? We're hoping it would be uh, either your significant other or, or what have you. And you also need to know what are your plans for after school, sleepovers, 
you know, school breaks, what is that going to look like? Um, each child needs to be supervised. We'll get into the substitute caregiving too. Um, so we have two types of substitute caregiving. And what substitute caregiving is, is basically someone who will watch the child while uh, you are at work or while you're on vacation or to while you need, you know, a couple of days of me time. That would be your substitute caregiver. We have long-term and um, short-term substitute caregiving. And please keep in mind is that substitute caregiving needs to happen in your home because your home is a licensed facility. And so it cannot happen at grandparents' house. It cannot happen at aunt and uncle's home or the neighbor's home. It has to happen in your home. Now, we know there are times where you may need to run errands or you want to go to the movies where you may want an occasional babysitter, and that's totally fine uh, under prudent parenting as well. So we would request that whichever babysitter that you choose, that they be 14 or older and that you notify the placing worker and your licensor who you have to be uh, the babysitter. Now, foster children, if they're 14 and up, they can definitely uh, provide babysitting as well. Your own children can also be the babysitter. But you want to definitely make sure that you have a young adult, teen or what have you, that is responsible, that um, can basically make sure where your emergency procedures are and how to contact you. Because if something should happen in your home, we're going to be looking for you okay so keep in mind that we do allow uh these things in place for you all to take the needed break um in order for you all to get some rest and also you mm -hmm. need to realize that once you take the prudent parenting mm -hmm. training it will talk more about babysitters and how much and how old and when okay right. yes Okay, so the long-term subcare uh, must be 18 years old. They must be able to complete a background study and have clearance, okay? They cannot have a disqualification. So if, whoever you choose to be um, your short-term, uh, I mean, not short-term, but your substitute caregiver, you want to have an honest conversation with them. You want to get in their face and you want to say, hey, I need for you to be honest with me. Is there anything on your background that I should be aware of? Because if we pull their background check and they have um, some issues, that's going to pose some issues for you, okay? So you want to definitely choose folks who can pass a background. Also, the substitute caregiver must sign a statement that they're in good health and physically able to provide care. We do request that um, they attend training, especially if you are providing care for, you know, youth zero to five or uh, zero to eight uh, for car seat training. If you're providing care for children who might have some mental health challenges, we definitely want them to take um, children's mental health. So some of these uh, courses, your licensor will review with you as well as you begin to talk about uh, who you designate as your substitute caregiver. Now for long-term substitute caregiving, that is 120 days of consecutive um, care that they're providing for uh, the youth in your home. Let's talk about short-term. Short-term means less than 72 hours of continuous care. Um, and with short term, they do not have to meet the requirements of a long term substitute caregiver, but there will be times where your licensor may request that they do complete um, background checks and that's going to be a discussion with you and your licensor. Uh, you all must agree on who you decide to be your substitute caregiver. You must um, also, if you're providing care for a medically fragile child, you want to train your uh, substitute caregiver on uh, the appropriate ways to provide care for that child. And again, we would require that they attend training. 
so they know as well how to provide care. So when that substitute caregiver comes into your home, we want to make sure that you as the um, license holder that you provide all the information on the child's emotional, behavioral, medical, and physical condition. Now, of course, because of HIPAA laws, we do not want you sharing any and everything. You definitely want to let them know what the daily routine is, if they have any allergies to medicine or food, definitely you want to let them know what that is, what their bedtime is, of course. Um, you want to uh, inform your substitute caregivers where your emergency procedures are. So we usually tell folks to list that play card on top of your refrigerator or on your refrigerator or on your cabinet where it's visible. Uh, also informing your sub cares where the fire extinguisher and your first aid supplies are, your evacuation plans, as well as how to notify uh, the agency in case of an emergency. Does anyone have any questions regarding substitute caregiving? Raise your hand, speak out loud. <laughs> okay, okay. Woo, moving on. So as you all know, um, you're basically working as a team with everyone. I mean, you have everyone involved in the child's life. You have the placing worker, you have your licensor, you have the guardian ad litem, you may have mental health professionals that are coming out to your home. You also have teachers. So we're all working together to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the child. And part of being and working together is that you have to immediate, re, immediately report any changes in the child's behavior or health uh, to uh, the placing worker, as well as if there's any changes in your household to uh, your licensor as well as the placing worker. So say for example, um, the child is in your home and you all are having a blast and the child uh, gets excited. They're running throughout the house, even though you told them, do not run in my house. This is a household rule. Well, if that child happens to run, slip and fall and breaks their leg, what is the first thing you're going to do? Anyone? Talk to me. Call 911. That's yeah, right. That's right. Shantae, right. 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 yes. That's what we want you to do. Wait, you I can't hear you. I, I'm unmute trying. Her. It won't unmute. It won't unmute. Unmute yeah, okay. your phone. All right. All right. Wait, you got unmute again. <laughs> Technology at its best. Right now, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Can yeah, we can hear you. We can hear yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, the first thing I would do, I would like call nine one one, and then I would call the um the um the caseworker and the licensing worker, and I would make out an incident report while I'm waiting for the MLMs to come. <laughs> Listen to you. What? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, she knew them all. She, she knew, knew them, them all. all. So you yeah. all, if you have any questions, ask Shantae because she got it on point. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but I like to listen. I like to take notes. Yeah, and I like to use the resources. Let me know how to do this and how to do that. If I don't know how to do it, I ask questions. Okay. Right. right, right. Very good. Very good. So we have the paramedics at your home and they pick the child up and they take that child to Woodwinds and they say, you know what, foster mom, foster dad, we think we need to operate. We think we need to put a cast on the child. Uh, can you sign this document right here? And the answer is no, 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 because you do not have legal custody of that child. You cannot sign any documents that the medical professionals present to you. Uh, if you sign any documents and that child becomes hurt on the uh, operating table, you will be held 
liable. As well as sometimes, you know, the medical facility may ask you to sign forms in regards to who's going to be financially responsible. And, you know, because this may be you're in a hurry, whatever, and you sign any and everything, if you sign on the dotted line that you will be financially responsible, they send you a bill that's $30,000, you will be responsible for that bill. And guess what? Yeah. Ramsey County does not reimburse. What you need to say is that this is um, Ramsey County. Uh, Ramsey County has legal or temporary custody of that child. Uh, you can let them know who the placing worker is, but you definitely do not want to sign anything. Otherwise, you would be um, responsible. And um, we do also have judges on call 24 seven. If you all cannot get in touch with us during this time, so the judge can consent to surgery <coughs> or what have you, okay? So everyone got that piece in regards to making two calls for, for anything that should occur, right? For example, if it yeah. happens at two in the morning, yeah. Um, how are you going to reach your placing worker? How are you going to reach your uh, licensing worker? Mm -hmm. There is a emergency on call listed yeah. on your emergency numbers. Yeah. And they know exactly how to get hold of those workers. So don't yeah. hesitate to so call then, them. Um, uh huh. Our, there was a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know who it was, though. Is it on the chat? I don't know. No, it's not on the chat. Okay. All right. All righty. So, um, moving on. So, um, you know, sometimes you may have placing workers who would allow for you to sign um, school information and medical care, medical care. Now, keep in mind that you all are allowed to make sure that the child um, attends their well child checkups. We definitely want you to make sure that they're um, getting their routine medical care um, taken care of. If you happen to have a child who's on an individual educational plan and you need to attend one of those IEP meetings, um, definitely the school will provide a surrogate parent. So you do not have to sign any documentation. Um, you only sign documentation if the placing worker gives you permission to do so, okay? Um, in regards to placing the child on medication, no, that's not up to you. You want to have a direct conversation with the placing worker as well as medical uh, professionals to determine what is the best um, process to take to take at that time. So how many of you all like to travel? We like to get outside of Minnesota, right? We want to travel to Disney World, we want to travel to Greece, we want to travel to Alaska. Well, guess what? You need permission to do so. Even if you want to go and get cheap gas in Wisconsin, you know, Wisconsin is just what, 20 minutes away from here. You need to have permission. So the first thing you would want to do is give the placing worker at least, I would say maybe two to three uh, weeks notice that you would like to travel. And it's up to the placing worker to have a discussion with the biological parent to see if they would be okay with uh, you all taking the child out of state. And if the uh, birth parent consents, then the placing worker will give you a travel permit. If the birth parent says, no, I refuse, I don't want my children going out of state. If the placing worker feels that it's a grand opportunity for the child, then the placing worker can uh, bring up a motion before the courts and the judge will make a decision. And, uh, and I can tell you from experience that the judges will okay a travel permit, okay? 
Uh, two calls for everything, like we stated before, you definitely want to call the placing worker and the licensor for any questions or concerns, any emergencies. Definitely, if you cannot get a hold of us, we want you to leave messages. You want, we want you to send texts or emails. And we state that because, you know, if you let us know as soon as possible, then you are covered. But if you happen or fail uh, not to let us know, then that could be issues of concern. Okay. All right. How many of you growing up were disciplined? Let's see some hands somewhere. I raised mine. Did you? Okay, I raised oh, mine sir. too. Yeah, Wonderful. Yeah. All righty. Well, listen, we have children coming through the child welfare system that have experienced trauma. To what extent? Some of us may not know, you know, so we want to make sure that we're using positive discipline techniques. We do not want you to take matters into your own hand. We don't want you parenting or discipline, disciplining while you're angry, okay? Definitely, we want you to utilize resources. We know this is difficult work. We're not negating that fact, but we also want to make sure that we provide you with resources uh, to parent and discipline, and that could be through training, as well as if you have a youth in your home that's receiving therapy, uh, that you would request, you know, suggestions and recommendations and strategies from uh, that therapist to also help you with um, disciplining that child. Um, you know, we want you to have a plan. We want you to be creative. But again, we do not want you disciplining out of anger. If we happen to find out that you physically abuse a child, that you uh, emotionally abuse the child, then your license will definitely be in jeopardy, okay? And we'll talk about that in your nuts and bolts training. But please, please, please talk with your licensor, attend training. We have some good trainings that I think will be uh, good for you as well, okay? And also, you all will have to sign a discipline policy, okay? All righty, you all, now that you are foster parents, are mandated reporters. Do you all know what a mandated reporter is? Anyone? Do I see anyone? No? Yes, a mandated oh. reporter is somebody who is required to report any suspected abuse or neglect of any kind of a child or a vulnerable adult. Wow, That's Denise, correct. you're on a roll this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so Denise hit it on the mark. That's basically it. You know, if you're at uh, Whole Foods or if you're at Lunds, you know, and you see a young adult being, not a young adult, even a child being abused, you want to report it as soon as possible. And you're going to report it to um, the police, number one. Um, you're going to report it to child protection, of course, as well as if you see a vulnerable adult, if they have been financially exploited, you want to definitely report it. And you can report it in good faith. So what that means is that you can remain anonymous. You do not have to tell uh, anyone who you are, but we definitely want you to report it as soon as possible. If you fail to report it, then you can face uh, some charges, okay? So if it's a family member, friend, neighbor, and you have eyes on a situation, you wanna definitely make sure that you report it. Okay, this is the play card you should have received with all the important phone numbers. And of course, we would list um, your licensor's uh, information and the child's uh, social worker. So everyone should have received this already. Um, Rhoda, here we go. So let's talk about how child foster care affects your family. Mm, how has it affected your family? Has your family changed? No, it's just the same as it was before? 
Anyone? No, but mine's definitely changed. <laughs> How did it change? Mine's did too. I got caught off guard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's go with let's go with Denise first. Um, well, Marv was just talking there. Um, they, we've been taking care of them for so long before all this that it oh. isn't like a huge change. Mm -hmm. So they're so, uh, they're my biological grandchildren. So uh, I, when things were starting to go down with my daughter, uh, we've been we've been watching both of them since they were babies. Okay. So essentially, it's the same. Okay. But now right. uh, uh, our our uh, our daughter is 14, and uh, Mackenzie's 13 now. So the only thing is changing is that they're starting to kind of start sharpening their fingernails on each other a little bit. Besides that, everything's about the same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, with, okay. and with this COVID thing going on, and we're all stuck in a house all the time. It's got mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Anyone Tracy? else? Tracy. Yeah, I'll go ahead and agree with the uh, everyone stuck in the house because of COVID. Um, so mm -hmm. I have a 17 year old daughter and a 11 year old son and a six year old son, which they are both both have autism, ADHD. Mm -hmm. so my hands full mm -hmm. there, but uh, the girls who are 14 and nine, they tend to bicker a lot. So mm -hmm, I'm going to mm -hmm. manage that. But other than that, you know, surprisingly, it's been going pretty good because, um, you know, I grew up on discipline and mm -hmm. order and clean your room and, and uh, you know, you listen to what the parent says. So, yeah. Okay. Well, the areas that we found out that really changed was the privacy. You don't have mm -hmm. privacy anymore. Okay. I bet you have the placing worker, you're going to have the licensing worker, you're going to have the guardian that lied them from court, and they're all going to be kind of traipsing through your house. Mm -hmm. um, well, they used to. With the pandemic, I'm sure they're not. Mm -hmm. But they would be coming in and out and kind of checking on what's going on in your home. The other piece is the peer versus parent. Um, yeah, because if you were the wonderful aunt or a great grandparent that took them to the movies all the time and baked cookies when they came over and all of a sudden they're there 24-7, it's entirely different, isn't it? It's like you need to go to bed at a certain time, you need to do your homework, all of that. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it changes the dynamics of the family quite a bit. Then we have the other family members. Now, all of you are relative kin providers. So within your family, whether before the pandemic, whether you celebrated the July 4th or Thanksgiving or, you know, I'm sure you had family members that might take you aside in the kitchen and say, hey, mm -hmm. why do you have Jim and Terry in your home? Mm -hmm. What are you going to say to those family members? Any ideas? No anybody, one. anybody got any thoughts about what the answer would be? Just say that I didn't, uh, we're taking care of them. Um, I and didn't hear that question. We might make it um, permanent depending on, on how things turn out with the family. That is correct. I was asking how you would tell other family members that might inquire as to why you've had your grandchildren or your nieces and nephews for such a long time, what mm -hmm. happened to the bio parents. And Shawanda said, you know, I think it was you, was it you? No, it was Denise, wasn't oh, it? Oh, Denise, that, you know, we're keeping them and it might be permanent or it might not. <clears throat> you, because of HIPAA laws, cannot go in, and I know this sounds strange because you're relatives, and I'm mm -hmm. sure 
information travels around the relatives, family circles, you can't say, well, I've got so-and-so because mom's on meth and dad is in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You cannot, because of privacy laws, divulge that. All mm -hmm. you need to tell these people, which are your family members, or your neighbors when they see a different child playing out in your lawn is that that child will be with you for a while and we you do not know how long okay mm -hmm. how many of you have biracial children that you're caring for all right oh. how do you deal with the cultural issues that come up with that well, I don't, I don't have any. You don't have any? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have the kids. I don't have the kids with me, but I have biracial grandchildren. I have like 33 grandchildren. Okay. So we don't have, we haven't had no issues yet. <laughs> Good. Good. That, that's a lot of grandchildren. I have 33 grandchildren. <laughs> Go well, I have um, biracial grandchildren too as well. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. This year, Wanda, I have um, about like four of them, and I have thirteen grandchildren. Uh huh. Okay. Wow. So you know, I'm um, uh, and then I have family members, my cousins, and them. They bad Rachel too. So you know, we was brought up to love everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And the other piece I want to mention is that when you deal with cultural issues, you know, if you have children that are are biracial or have a different culture you have to learn to respect that culture right yes cuz see like my that is part my of nephew, them the one excuse me the one i have now uh -huh. his brother is biracial mhm mm so yes. yeah it's all it's all real mixed in my family well children know um when they are say biracial or they have some cultural issues, they know that you need to be very objective when dealing with it and accept both sides. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't feel that you respect both of the cultures or the races that they are, then you don't respect them. And I just throw that in there because a lot of times children identify, even though they're your relatives, mm -hmm. they really kind of identify on the cultures and the races. Um, we talk about family values and we talk about rules. Some of you know that your relatives uh, did not really enforce a lot of family values or rules. So when they come to your house and they think that eating dinner is a bag of potato chips and a Pepsi while walking around playing a video game, it's going to take them a while to get used to the rules that you have in your house. But believe me, from experience, it provides a very secure place for them because they actually know where their meals are coming from, who can they depend on, who will get them up to go to school, all of that that they might in the back of their minds have worried about when they were in their home space. It really makes them feel much more secure. And I'm not saying that they're going to just jump right up and be wonderful with it, and you might get some pushback, but they actually are making them feel very secure, mm -hmm. okay? And we already talked about the changing roles, you know, mm -hmm. whether you were the fun aunt or the grandma that did this and that, now you have to add a parenting hat to that too. Did anybody else want to add something? Nope. All okay. Right. I can't. 
Is it freezing up on you? Yeah, it's freezing. Yeah. This is foster care payment. How many of you get paid from Ramsey County for foster care? Okay. How many of you have gotten your checks? All right. No payment issues? That's wonderful to hear. That's I just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. I just I have not. Oh, Shawanda has not. Shawanda, okay. All right. So we should follow up on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I haven't received any sort of payment. I ain't fill out nothing. I ain't know I pulled aside anything. I don't know nothing. Okay, right. okay. Uh Patrice, we see you too. System. Okay. We see you All too, right. Patrice. We got you. Patrice. Oh, uh, okay, because yeah, I ain't received, I don't know. Okay. okay. Ain't nobody talked to me about that. Nicole ain't uh, talked okay. to me about that yet. All right. Okay. So let me just give you an overall view of how Ramsey County does it. I can't speak for other counties. We can only speak for Ramsey County. Ramsey County foster care payments are always a month behind. If you got your relatives, children in April, you won't get paid for that until May. If you got children in May, you won't get paid for that until June. Um, what happens in our system is that you supply us with a W-9 form that tells your uh, social security number. It goes through, it gets processed by the accounting people, and then they send you out a payment invoice form. It's called the PIP. On that form, it will state the child or children's name, and then it will oh, ask you how many days that child has been in your care for, that's fine, for the okay. actual month that is listed there. And you have to say if they came on the 3rd of May, and this is what, the 31st, you have to count how many days, put it on there, sign it, and send it back. Um, and that's how Ramsey County does their payments. You should also let your licensor know if you would like direct deposits. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many of you that are involved um, have done the MAPSI? One, Shawanda, have you done it? You say done the who? MAPSI. MAPSI? Yes, mm -hmm. I, I just got my certificate. I did the the alcohol. I just received this. Mm -hmm. okay. I completed my alcohol. I just received the 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 nuts and bolts certificate. No, not that, not that, dear. Okay. So oh, okay. I'm going to tell you about what they call the Minnesota Assessment for Parenting Children and Youth. Short, in short, it's called MAPSI. And what the MAPSI does is ask you what you have to do above and beyond regular parenting mm -hmm. to assist the foster children, your relatives' children in your home. Now, what Ramsey County does is divide it into three categories alphabetically. We have three assessors on the eighth floor and what they will do is call, call you and say um how is your granddaughter or your grandson doing tell me about them i just want to let you know that i want you to be open and honest with them when you're talking to the assessor that calls you and tell them all of the stuff that you do if you have to take that child to therapy, you need to tell them that. If you have to stay up at night because the child has night terrors, you need to tell them that. If you have to go up to the school, or used to have to go up to the school, mm -hmm. two or three times a week, you need to tell them that. Because they will rate the child and if they rate that child high enough, 
it will increase your monthly payment for the child. Make sure you let them know if you are are supervising visits, whether you're transporting to and from visits. And I, I also want you to tell them if you have to enroll that child in a daycare. Because we don't pay for daycare. We try mm -hmm. to make it up in other ways. Mm -hmm. So I want all of you just to keep that in mind when you talk to the MAPC assessor. Any questions? Mm -hmm. None? All right. All righty, y'all. It's the end. Oh, Denise has the question. I do. Um, I just wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier, um, uh -huh. which was um, like for summer activities or um, things like that that you can get support. What sorts of things mm -hmm. are available? Like. Um, you know, I'm just trying to think, I mean, I know that there's um, camps are pretty much closed throughout the state, at least for right now. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some other things that um, some of the community centers are doing with social distancing. Is mm -hmm. that the kind of stuff that you can provide resources for or what? Yes. Um, yes. What's the process? That's the stuff you would actually talk you know? to the licensing worker about. Okay. And as say, well as the placing worker. Oh, yeah, the placing worker, too to see if you can't come up with some activities for the children. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, I, I just wondered if they if there were, because I know that there were also quite a few foundations around town that used to pay for camp for kids. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I wish that we could have accessed that this year, but, it, you know, this is not gonna happen. Oh, yeah. I just wondered I, if there were other things, because they, you know, they're pretty active. They like to, to do things. And um, one of them would like to explore archery. It's pretty expensive. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, we'd like to explore, but, you know, we need some help to do it. So. Sure. Yes, sure. definitely lean on the placing worker so they can assist you with that. And just tell them this is definitely an activity that will build the child's self-esteem and you think it's a wonderful um, opportunity. And Some, uh, we could definitely try and assist. Sometimes organizations too, if you tell them it's a foster child that they might give a discount or a sliding fee or for mm -hmm. sure like the YMCA does that. Mm -hmm. um, so just something to think about mm -hmm. um, asking. The other thing I wanted to really briefly mention is support for foster parents. We, mm -hmm. do, we do have a support group that meets once a month. It's on the fourth Monday of the month. And it's right now they're doing them via Zoom, but you they're, it's just listed always on the training calendars or you can call our training number and sign up for that. When we meet in person again, this is the only training that you can bring children to and they have pizza and stuff for the foster care kids as well. But it's just a great opportunity for you to get support or when you do have questions and you don't know what you're doing or mm -hmm. and get support from other foster parents. So I've heard really good things about it. Ramsey County doesn't facilitate it. It's facilitated by a whole different agency. Um, and it, it's just really a good opportunity so to feel supported. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Callie, is that Volunteers of America that does that? No, it's called um, NED. I get that wrong, Karen, every time. NADCA? NAD. Uh, Minnesota Council on Adoptive Children. Okay. Minnesota, yeah. And the other thing that's really NADCAC. good. NADCAC. NADCAC. Mm -hmm. NADCAC also has a Facebook page for foster care people. And it's really got a lot of resources and help and another good way to support each other. But it's through Matt NADCAT and um, just a lot of um, really helpful things on there. Same with Minnesota Adopt. They have tons of, it sounds, they're, they're talking about changing their name because you think, oh, Minnesota Adoption, it's all about adoption. But they do mm -hmm. Work with children in foster care as well, and they have tons of resources. They have a helpline if you just don't know what to do that you can call. They have trainings, so you'll see we work with them quite a bit. Okay, anyone have any last minute questions? <laughs>